And so where we find ourselves here in chapter 8 is right before a great coming together of God's people. Ezra and Nehemiah and the Levites bring together God's people some 42,000 before the word of the Lord. And we have together here on the first day of the month, of the seventh month of the year, this coming together of God's people to hear the word of God read. And so it's here in the presence of God's people that Ezra stands up above all the people. He has men on his right, men on his left, and he heralds the word of the Lord. He reads to them the law of God. Ezra preaches to him, and it's right here in verse 9 that we find ourselves, and it says this, And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. So God's people in this day have been cut to the heart. They found themselves exposed before a holy God. The word was read, and they realized their generational rebellion before the Lord and their individual rebellion before the Lord. They found themselves sinful before a holy God, and they were cut to the very core. They'd been overcome with grief. But they'd been commanded by Nehemiah and Ezra and the scribes not to mourn. They'd been commanded to stop their grieving. And we have biblical warrant from the scriptures that we should have sorrow over our sin. You and I should not be flippant over our sin, which sent our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to the cross. And what Nehemiah and what this passage is teaching us is that while it is good to have godly sorrow over our sin and good godly grief over our sin, Our our gaze should not stay there forever. Our gaze should be lifted up high to see this God who has done great things for his people. And in so doing, joy and strength should be increased in the life of his people. And I think it's this right here that you and I are in great need of today. You and I are in need of constant reminder that in the midst of our own sin... As God's word is laid bare upon your heart and you see all of your failings and shortcomings before Christ, we need to lift our gaze to our great Redeemer and find great joy and strength in Him and in Him alone. So this first thing that I would like us to consider is this, is that God's people are not to be overcome with grief because He has given them divine joy. Notice what the first part of verse 10 says. He says, Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Notice he says here, the joy of the Lord. It's joy that is given from above. In the midst of Israel's weeping, Nehemiah and Ezra and the Levites command the people not to weep and grieve, but to lift their eyes, to be reminded of everything that God has done. The day that is happening here and why they say not to weep and why they are to rejoice and be overcome with gladness is because this is the Feast of Trumpets. We learn about it in Leviticus 23, 24. It was a day set aside as holy. It was a holy convocation unto the Lord. It was a day that there was to be rest. It was a day of great sacrifice. It was a a day where there was to be no work done. And it was a day of great memorial, a day of remembrance. And so there are several things that could be possible in view here. Many commentators go back and forth of what was being remembered on the day of trumpets. What were the Israelites, the people of God, remembering back to and blowing the trumpets louder and longer than any time they ever had before on this particular day. And there's at least three possibilities, and let me name them here. 
The first possible is that to, they were to remember when the law was given to them on Mount Sinai. Potentially thinking back to that great day when the Lord descended upon the mountain and He revealed His Word to them. He gave them His law. He prescribed to them who He is and how they are to function as His people ever before Him. Secondly, it could be that they are to remember the creation of the world. That God has created all things. That He's sovereign over all things. That He's spoken all things into existence. And that He is their creator and they are the creation. And we are to remember that. Thirdly, it could be to remember God in rescuing Isaac from the sword of his father Abraham by providing a sacrifice in the ram and foreshadowing the Messiah who would come, who would provide great rescue ultimately for all of God's people. So I'm not certain which one is in view here, but I know for a fact what is in plain view here, and it is this, that God is at the center of every one of those. That God as its center is what is in view here. God is the one who gave the law. God is the one who has created all things. And God who is the one who has provided this great sacrifice uh, in, in the place of Isaac. And so what should be the, 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 the response of God's people when they were thinking upon these things is that they are filled with great joy as he provides in order that we would rightly ascribe the worship that is due his name. And so I want you and I to consider the many ways in which God gives us his divine joy in our lives this day. Consider with me three ways in which God's joy, this divine joy, overcomes our grief when we are weighed down because of our sin. Firstly is this, that divine joy flows from the hearts of God's people as they remember that God is God and he is their God. So think about that for a moment. Listen to what Psalm 93, 1 and 2 says. It says, The Lord reigns. He's robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He is put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. Psalm 93 is very clear that God is God, that He is the one who reigns, that only He is the one who is robed in majesty. And have you thought about that this morning? Have you thought that this God, who has created all things, who has given His law, who has given us His word, that He's majestic, that He's beautiful, that he sits far above all his creation and he loves his people. Have you thought about the fact that he has spoken all things into existence? Have you thought recently that he has around himself as a belt strength that is immovable strength? It is strength unlike the world can compare. There is no strength on this earth that compares to the strength of our God. And yet it is this God this day that we have the opportunity and the privilege to come into his presence and to worship him and to gaze upon his beauty and his strength this day. It is this reality that Nehemiah and Ezra are bringing before the people of God to remind them, look who God is. See how worthy of worship he is this day and every day henceforth. Have you gazed upon his beauty this morning? Have you thought recently about how great God is and how God God is? That there is none like him. There is no one like our God. And it should produce in the life of God's people joy, happiness, and gladness should overflow from our hearts as we think upon this truth. But there's a step further for God's people. Not only is God God, but he is their God. Notice with me in 2 Samuel 7, 24. And this is true of you if you are in Christ. 
If you believe upon the Lord Jesus, if you've repented of your sins, God is your God, and you can lay claim to these truths as well that we see in the scriptures. 2 Samuel 7, 24 says, And you established for yourself your people Israel to be your people forever. And you, O Lord, became their God. Psalm 16, 2 says, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. And Psalm 118, 28 says this, You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Have you stopped this morning and thought about that? That if you are in Christ, Christ has purchased you, and you lay claim to the truth that God is your God, that you are his people, that you can lay claim to all the truths that find their yes and amen in Christ because God is your God. Spurgeon says it this way, all the attributes of God become wellsprings of joy to the thoughtful, contemplative believer. For such a man says within his soul, all these attributes of my God are mine. His power is my protection. His wisdom, my guidance. His faithfulness, my foundation. His grace, my salvation. He is a God who cannot lie, faithful and true to his promise. He is all love and at the same time infinitely just, supremely holy. If you are in Christ, all of those attributes of God are yours. In Christ, this God belongs to you and you belong to him. And it should produce in the life of God's people great joy, great happiness and satisfaction. Children, look at me this morning. Did you know that if your faith is in Christ Jesus, if you've repented of your sin and you've turned to him for the forgiveness of your sin, that he's united you with himself, that you are united to God in Christ and all of the wonderful attributes of God are yours in Christ, that this God who we speak of this morning is your God. You have a faithful God. You have a powerful God. You have a good and loving God and a holy God and a just God. And he is yours and you are his. The scripture says that I am my beloved, my beloved's and he is mine. Children, if you are in Christ, this is your God. He is yours. And the more and more you continue to dwell on that reality, the more that you sit in family worship and pay attention and hear the truths of the scriptures, the more that you listen to your father and your mother as they're teaching you the truths of God, as you age and as you get older and you reflect and you dwell upon all these wonderful promises, the Lord uses it to increase your joy and increase your strength where you become one day a mature believer who stands firm in all the things that life may bring your way. So don't neglect these wonderful truths. Listen to every opportunity you have that the Lord puts before you in family worship, in your time of reading, and even in gathering here this morning. So here's the thing that you have to ask yourself. Has God's word exposed your sin before him? When you come to the scriptures and you put yourself under the authority of God's word and you see what God's word says about this or that in your life <clears throat> and you find yourself wayward, even as a Christian, you find yourself straying. Do you come back to this truth that God is God and that he is your God, that he is the anchor of your soul? Can there be anything more assuring than that truth there? That the God who's created all things, who has laid the foundations of the world, promises to never leave or forsake his people. May that produce great joy and divine joy in your life. But secondly, <clears throat> divine joy flows from the hearts of God's people when they think of his sweet salvation. 
in this day that Nehemiah speaks of, just a few days afterwards, they would be celebrating the Day of Atonement, Passover. <clears throat> so even on this day, as the trumpets are blowing loudly, as they're thinking back to all that God has done, they're also thinking forward to this Day of Atonement, this Day of Passover, the moment when God delivered his people from Egypt by their escape over this final plague, death. That all who had posted on their doorpost the blood of the spotless lamb, death passed over them and they were rescued out of bondage. This a great picture of what Christ has done for all of his people. And so it is this truth and this sweet salvation that we have in Christ that we must dwell on regularly as God uses it to produce great joy in your heart <clears throat> and in my heart. So I want us to consider three ways in which our salvation is sweet. Three ways in which we find such a sweet salvation. <clears throat> Firstly this, consider the cost of your salvation. Have you thought recently on what it cost for your sin to be forgiven? <clears throat> your sin of disobedience your sin of pride, your sin of apathy to the things of God, all the sin in which you know has put Christ upon the cross. Such a precious cost, a great cost. Philippians 2, 8 says this, And being found in human form, he humbled himself, he being Christ, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That your sin and my sin has put Christ our Redeemer upon the cross. That he spilled his precious blood for his people so that you could have redemption. So that you could say with a loud voice, I am free from the penalty of my sin. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And you can lay claim to that truth because of the precious cost of Christ Jesus upon the bloody cross. As God's people in Nehemiah's day would think upon that spotless lamb over the doorposts, it would put their mind forward as one who would come. One who would come, who would be this spotless lamb, who would be the one who would walk in the ways blameless, who would live as we live yet without sin, who would die a death that you and I do not deserve, that, that he did not deserve, but that you and I so deserve, and that would place him upon the cross, enduring the wrath of his father, for every sin that you and I have ever committed or will commit. When you think upon that great cost of your salvation and the fact that Christ has gone to the cross instead of you and instead of me, that he has borne your penalty, that he took upon himself God's wrath in your stead, that we will not taste death and that because of what Christ has done, we will be with him forevermore. Do you not well up inside of your soul with great joy, with great gladness, with great happiness? Secondly, consider the planning of your salvation. The planning of your salvation. Have you thought for a moment that Christ is not an afterthought? Christ was not a plan B in securing redemption for his people. Because Ephesians 4 and 1, 4 and 5 tells us that he chose us in Christ, in him, before the foundation of the world. That this sweet salvation that should produce great joy in the life of God's people was planned before the world was ever created. That he had in mind his people and he set them apart for himself. Have you pondered on that recently? That before anything was, 
God's people were upon his mind, that he set his affections upon them. Romans 8, 29 says, for those whom he foreknew, it means to forelove, to set his affection upon beforehand. When you look at your sin that is exposed when God's word is opened, there is nothing inside you and me that are deserving of such grace and love. There is nothing in you and I that is deserving of, of God's love and affection from before the foundation of the world. It is only due to his loving kindness and his great plan of redemption that we are in Christ. And we of all people should rejoice greatly at that truth. We should be overcome with great joy. We should fall to our knees because of what God has done in his mercy and his kindness for his people. Have you thought recently that you didn't plan your own salvation, but God planned it from before the foundation of the world? And it was such a great grace to do so. Thirdly, consider the agent of your salvation. Many people nowadays like to lay claim to having a part in their own salvation. We like to lay claim that I did something. I had a part in this. I was more learned than the next guy. I made a really good decision while all these other people make terrible decisions. The scripture is abundantly clear that the agent of your salvation is God and God alone. Listen to what Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Where is our boast? It is not in us. Did we save ourselves? Did we plan our salvation? Did we bring it to fruition? Did we foreknow ourselves? Did we predestine ourselves? Did we call ourselves? Did we justify ourselves? Or did we glorify ourselves? No. Every bit of our salvation has God at the center. And it should produce in us great worship for the grace that we have been shown. The gift of grace and the gift of faith to even believe upon such a promise that Christ Jesus has come into the world to save sinners. Have you thought recently on your sweet salvation that God has freely given to you? Thirdly, divine joy flows from the hearts of God's people when they remember that their good shepherd never leaves them in their time of trial. Divine joy flows from the hearts of God's people when they remember that their good shepherd never leaves them in their time of trial. The city walls have been destroyed, but Nehemiah comes to God and he prays to him the promises that God himself declared that he keeps his covenant and his steadfast love for his people, that he hasn't forgotten his people. Even in the midst of their exile, he was under their care. Even in the midst of their waywardness, they did not go outside of his loving mercies. Even when they were feeling as if they were abandoned, they were never abandoned. God never leaves or forsakes his people. And you and I must be reminded of what John 10 teaches us, that we have a good shepherd, and he's so good, he's so good, that not only does he love his sheep, but he lays his life down for them. Listen to what John 10, 11 through 13 says. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Christ Jesus is not a hired hand. Christ Jesus is the good shepherd who amidst our trial and amidst the difficulties of our life, 
And amidst the toils and the dangers that we might undergo and undertake in this life, we have a good shepherd who is so near. We have a good shepherd who, when disaster strikes in our life, or when trial may come, he doesn't flee and run as if that danger might overtake him. But we have a strong shepherd, a strong shepherd who protects with his staff and draws us near and draws you close to his bosom. Christ Jesus is a wonderful shepherd who has laid down his life for his people. Romans 8, 38 and 39 even give us a closer picture of this great shepherd, this great love that we have in Christ, this great God that we are united to, the one who will never leave us or forsake us, the one who has promised to be with us to the end of the age. Romans 8, 38 and 39 says this, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have a good shepherd who never loses his sheep. He never forsakes them. Death, nor life, nor anything can separate us from his love. And the question that you and I must ask is, has, has this truth, does this truth come to the forefront of your mind when you face trials? James tells us that we are to consider it joy when we face trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance or perseverance. So we should even consider that joy. And even from last week's sermon, just the providence of God, knowing that he's working and orchestrating all of these things in our life to make us and conform us more into the image of his son. We should even find in the hard times joy in that. But even more so because we have a savior. We have a shepherd who never leaves us in those times. In those trials, we have one that we can cry out to with a loud voice and he hears us. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice and I know theirs. He, he knows us intimately. He knows us dearly because he's purchased us with his own blood. If you are in Christ, he has purchased you. And you have, as your good shepherd, a great, great redeemer. Questions for us this morning and for you is this. Is, has the wolf come into your pasture as of late? Has danger come into your life recently? Jesus tells us that there are shepherds who leave when the wolf comes, when the danger strikes, because all they care about is the money. And he's speaking of pastors and those who care for the souls of people in that passage. But the emphasis and what we need to focus on is that Jesus is not like them. That even in the midst of your toils and your dangers, that Jesus will not abandon you. That he's given you his spirit as a comforter, as guide, as one even in those moments, the spirit works to actually lift your gaze to see Christ as far more glorious than your situation. As far more glorious than your circumstance. God has done this. Have you thought about that as of late? That if you are in Christ, you have this good shepherd near and dear to your soul. And have you been joyful for it? Have you been glad? I think of you husbands and you fathers in the room. When God's word is opened, when God's word is laid bare upon your life, in our duties as husbands and fathers. When you see your commands from our Lord, from our King, that we're to lead and guide our family spiritually in, in, in family worship, that you are to wash your wife in the water of the Word, that you're to care for them, that you're to guide them, that you're to come home from your vocation and to continue and to press on in this great work 
of leading and guiding your family to the throne room of grace as you pray around the dinner table and ask the Lord's blessing upon your life and ask the Lord to work and move in the life of your family. Husbands and fathers, you have a great, great duty. Our work is not done when we come home. And when you read in the scripture and you see what our king commands, and the word cuts you in such a way where you know you're falling short. Are you overcome with grief? Are you overcome with despair? Do you find yourself just saying, just woe is me, only looking at yourself? Or are you reminded here that you have a good shepherd who never leaves you or forsakes you, who strengthens you as you think upon all the wonderful promises that you have in him? And as the joy starts to overflow in your heart, do you repent of those things in which you have failed, in which you have fallen short in? And do you press on towards the prize of Christ, continuing to, by his strength, do what he has commanded as a husband and as a father? May God increase your joy as a husband and a father as you think on these things. I think of you wives and mothers in the room and the difficulty in the task that you have to lead the home, to, 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 to work in the home, to raise godly children. I know it is a joy and it is also difficult. I know it's not easy. And yet it is a command from our Lord that we do it and we do it with joy and that you do it well. Do you find yourself in those moments where you have fallen short, where the weight of just the reality of your day when you have had this plan and this plan and this plan set in place all falls apart? Do you find yourself downtrodden and downcast? Do you find yourself overcome with grief? In the things that you have fallen short in, in the things that you have sinfully neglected, repent of those things. And lift your head to your good shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, who strengthens you, whose mercies are made new to you each morning to carry out these wonderful and amazing duties that you have to govern the home and to raise godly children and to prepare the home in such a way that would be glorifying to God. May he increase your joy in those days and in those moments that are difficult as you look to Christ Jesus, your good shepherd, who never abandons you even in those days. And I think for all of you who profess Christ, all of you in this room who know Christ Jesus as Lord, when you think of the day of your trial, when you stand in the marketplace, when you stand in your vocation, when you stand out in the highways and the byways and you proclaim the excellencies of Christ, when you proclaim the gospel and the good news and you're persecuted for it, you're hated for it, and you find yourself being jeered at, and you find yourself being ignored, you find yourself being made fun of, you find yourself being hated. Be reminded that your good shepherd says that they will hate you for my name's sake. Be reminded that those who stand firm and proclaim the good news of the gospel, even though you are hated for his name's sake, he loves you dearly. That in these moments we can draw strength being reminded that the good shepherd hasn't abandoned us. That even though we may be out in the marketplace by ourselves heralding the word of truth, we may be in our vocation standing alone as the only believer. We have a good shepherd who has all authority on heaven and on earth and he stands near and he has not forsaken you. And may you draw strength and joy from that truth as you do so. It reminds me of the Apostle Paul, one whom in which we are greatly familiar with. 
But in 2 Corinthians 11, 24 through 28, we see this great trial that Paul has gone through. Many of the great difficulties that he endured for the namesake of Christ. It says this, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my my anxiety for the churches. Paul is one who has endured great difficulty and great trial. His back was ripped open five different times. He was shipwrecked, floating at sea, A night and a day, he was adrift. And what do you think he clung to in that moment? What do you think he held on to as he was drifting in that sea? It wasn't only the thing that was keeping him afloat physically, but it was the one who was keeping him afloat spiritually, his good shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom he met on the road to Damascus, who changed his life completely, and who secured and purchased him upon the cross. This is how Paul was able to endure great difficulty and great trial. Because the joy of knowing Christ Jesus as Lord, the joy of knowing Christ Jesus as a good shepherd who greatly loves his sheep, endured and produced great strength in Paul to stand and take those lashes. To to stand and take the stoning. To stand and take the beating. And to endure all the dangers that came his way. And may you and I, as we also look to Christ in our trial, in our difficulty, may we be reminded of this, these joys that we have in our God. These joys that we find ultimately in Christ Jesus. That if you are in Christ, great joy is to be had in your heart, knowing God is God and your God. Great joy should overflow in your life as you think and dwell upon your sweet salvation. And great joy should be overflowing as you think and dwell upon the fact that Christ Jesus is your good shepherd. And what it should do in the life of every believer and what it has done in Paul, where he is able to say in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, for when I am weak, I am strong. How can Paul say that? How can Paul say these things, that he is strong when he's bent over, beaten 39 times, with his back ripped open, unable to stand, How can he say, when I'm weak, I am strong? It's verse 10. It's verse 10. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord was Paul's strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength, believer. Secondly, I want us to see what this this strength produces, what this joy produces. What does this joy bring about in the heart and life of a believer? Secondly, God's people are not to be overcome with grief because his joy is their refuge. His joy is their refuge. It says again in verse 10, For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Strength means refuge in Hebrew. It doesn't mean just mere physical strength, that you're going to be stronger physically that you're going to be able to stand longer physically or endure longer physically. What it means is that the joy of the Lord is your refuge. It's your strong tower. It's a mighty fortress, as it were. 
And here in Nehemiah's day, Israel had often looked horizontally for strength. They looked to themselves. They looked to other means for strength. And they didn't look vertically. They didn't look up. And as God's word is laid bare upon their lives in this convocation, in this day of trumpets, they realize that. They see that. They understand that. And they're cut to the heart. And they grieve. And they weep. And they're commanded to stop. They're commanded to stop. And they're reminded that the joy of the Lord is your refuge. That though you may have sought refuge elsewhere... Be reminded that if you are God's people, he has not abandoned you. Think back of all the promises of the ways that God has rescued his people. Think back of all the things that God has done in their stead. And it produces strength. It produces a place of refuge for God's people. Think of the ways in which Israel consistently sought strength horizontally. Strength in this life. They desired to go back to Egypt instead of trusting in the Lord as their refuge and provider. Here they are in the wilderness. Here they are just thinking back, it's so much better in Egypt. It would just be better to go back to bondage. They were looking in such horizontal, physical lenses that they were unable to see the strength and the might and the refuge of their God. Think about in the passage that we are in as a church now, in 1 Samuel, where the people of Israel desire to have a king like the nations. And so they choose Saul, a head and shoulders above the rest. Here's our strength. Here's our might. He's the tallest one among us. He's the most handsome among us. Surely he will guide us into great battle. Surely he will lead us in him will, he will be our strength. And they failed to see and to recognize that they already had a great king of strength in the Lord our God. Spurgeon says this, because you and I are, are regularly tempted, you and I are regularly tempted to find our refuge in our sin. You and I are constantly tempted to turn away from the refuge, which is joy in the Lord, which Him being our strength, Him being our refuge, and we are tempted daily to put our trust in sin as our refuge. And so we need to see first and foremost that the joy of the Lord is a refuge against the temptation of finding strength in our sin. And Spurgeon says it this way, Spurgeon says, since men fell in the garden, he is too often sought for his enjoyments where the serpent finds his. Is that you today? Are you finding your enjoyments? Are you finding your refuge, your strength where the serpent finds his? Are you finding yourself leaning on your own understanding? Are you finding yourself seeking strength that the world provides? Because I believe it was Luther that says this, that that we're tempted oftentimes in these three ways, by the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we need to know, and you need to know, that we have a great refuge in Christ. We have a great refuge in the joy of the Lord overflowing our heart and being reminded that No, I will not go back to this. I I have such a greater refuge, such a greater stronghold. I have far greater strength than the one who has purchased me with his own blood than what this could bring in my life. So when you find yourself tempted with the world's goods to find your strength and power there, will you draw back to remembrance all that God has done for you? Will you draw back to remembrance that God is God and if you are in Christ, he is your God? And will it bring to life joy forevermore that will allow you to stand firm in the strength that he provides? 
to, to say no and to resist these temptations that the world puts at our fingertips daily to find our refuge in? Will you turn and say no? Oh, I have a far more glorious joy. I have a far more glorious strength and refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ. I could never trust in what you offer. But what about your flesh? What about when your flesh comes roaring in? What about when your pride says to yourself, I know best. I know best. I, I know that the word says this, but like, I'm, I'm really certain that this is what it is. What do you do when you start to lean on your own understanding? What do you do when you start to kind of chart your own course? And you find yourself wayward, as sheep often do. May God's word be laid bare upon your heart. And may you see with spiritual eyes, with ears to hear, that you are wayward. And that you need to come back. And you need to not lean upon your own understanding, but you need to press into the Lord and all of his wisdom that he is freely given to us in his word and find hope and strength and joy there and there alone. But what about when you're tempted by the evil one? Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness and what did he do? He took God's word and he twisted it. What happens when, 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 when Satan says, did God really say? What happens when you find yourself there, starting to be led down the road of lies that has been paved by the father of lies? You need to be reminded of the promises that find their yes and amen in Christ. That if you know him, that if you've been purchased by him, that you could dare not trust such a lie because you have the truth ever before you. That you know 1 Peter 5, 8, that it comes out when Satan puts before you the twistedness of Scripture that he so loves to do. He so loves to take the truth and to twist it and to cause God's people to believe a fraction of the truth, which is a lie. Be reminded of what 1 Peter 5, 8 says. It says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Listen, you and I need to be reminded that we have an adversary. You and I need to be reminded that our flesh wars against us. You and I need to be reminded that we live in a world that hates God and constantly calls us to find our strength in it rather than him. And we, when we remind ourselves of this, joy and strength are produced. We need to know that even though the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, if you are in Christ, you have a redeemer in heaven as your refuge, the lion of Judah who eats him, who kills him, who has, who has put him to shame upon the cross. He's the prince of peace. He's the conquering king. He's, the, he's from everlasting to everlasting. This refuge in Christ, he sits upon the throne of David. He's the lamb who was slain. He's the alpha and the omega. He's preeminent. He is in whom all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. And if this be your Christ, he is your refuge. He is your refuge and your strength. Won't you lift your gaze there, brothers and sisters? Won't you lift your eyes to him and to find great joy and satisfaction and gladness in this life? For the Christian, Christ Jesus is their refuge. But if you are not in Christ, you do not have a refuge. If you have said to yourself, 
I don't care what the scripture says. I am my own refuge. I am my own strength. You need to hear that when the storm of God's wrath comes upon your life, you will fall and you will be cast out by the winds of his perfect justice and you will perish in hell forever under the curse of your own sin. You have no refuge in and of yourself. You have no strong tower that can stand before a good and holy God in his presence that will protect you from his wrath. But there is a refuge. There is a, res there is a refuge in which you can find rescue. There's a mighty fortress in whom the wrath of God was poured out upon and he has endured. This fortress is Christ Jesus. And oh, that you would run to him this morning. And oh, that you would place your faith and your trust in him for the forgiveness of your sins so that you can say with the assembly of God's people one day, blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, that you would run to him. I pray that you would do that if you are not in Christ and that you would find refuge in him and that the joy that he produces in your heart as you see what he's done in your stead, as you think upon the fact that God is your God and that he will never leave you or forsake you, that that joy would produce great strength and refuge in your heart. Run to him this day. There are two uses, two points of application that I'd like to leave you with this morning. And they're both found in verse 12. The end of verse 12 says this. Let me read all of verse 12. And it says, And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. God has given his people eyes to see and ears to hear. You have not done that, and I have not done that. God has done that in you. And the people here in this day, they understood the words that were declared to them. Not because they in themselves had something that was so intellectual and so great, but that God opened their eyes. They understood it. They heard it. They believed it. And two things flowed from that. That if you have eyes to see and if you have ears to hear this morning, and that if you know the joys of knowing Christ Jesus as Lord, and that you know that the joy of the Lord is your strength, may these two things be present in your life as well. It says, the joy of the Lord produces gospel proclamation. The joy of the Lord produces gospel proclamation. In the beginning of verse 12, it says, And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions. So they went out. This was a day of great sacrifice. And the people who had much went out and gave to those who had none. So that they could be invited into the sacrifice. So that they could participate. Oh, you who have such rich grace. Oh, you who have such a sweet salvation. Oh, you who have been Given the light of Christ, do you hide it under a bushel or do you proclaim it from the rooftop? May you be one who has been changed by God, who has such joy and strength in our refuge of Christ that you would go and proclaim to a world who is seeking refuge in themselves only to be destroyed in the last day. May you go and proclaim the good news to them that there is a Redeemer who lives. Christ Jesus has come into the world to save sinners. Secondly, the joy of the Lord produces rejoicing. It says this at the end. It says, and they made great rejoicing. Are you rejoicing this day? Do you rejoice regularly? When you think upon all the perils of this life and that God has not forgotten you, when you think that Christ Jesus has died in your stead, that all the promises of God find their yes and amen in Christ, that every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places belongs to you who are in Christ, 
Do you not rejoice? My prayer this morning is that all of us who are God's people and who know these truths would be overwhelmed with such joy that it would produce great rejoicing. And we have a great opportunity to do that in just a moment as we sing and as we extol the mercies and the wonders and the promises of God in our singing unto him as worship. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for Christ. We thank you that we who are not deserving of your love and mercy, that you have given us love and mercy in Christ. Father, I thank you that you have given us eyes to see and ears to hear. That when we open the word and we are torn to our heart because of our sin, that your spirit lifts our eyes to see Christ in our stead and it produces joy and strength to, to know that you love us. Father, may we who are weary run to Christ. May we find great joy in knowing him as Lord. And may you strengthen your people this day by the joy that you give them as they think regularly on all your promises, as they think upon your attributes, as they think upon you and you alone, may it produce joy, strength, and praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.